this Congress have many profound meanings. I'm very happy to be the coordinator uh, of this panel whose central theme is that uh, of uh, education for societal transformation, as you know. The premise uh, that will form the basis of, for discussion, this panel, is that uh, education is uh, the most uh, uh, decisive and strategic variable for accompanying and metabolizing any process of innovation and social transformation, not simply an instrument. About a fortnight ago, I participated also as a, a devil AAS delegate in the UNESCO International Conference Paris, also to deliver uh, the, our official uh, uh, invitation to the UNESCO General Directorate, where there was a lot of discussion about the uh, uh, future of education, education, a new social contract. This is the title of the new UNESCO Global Action and of an old scientific publication online. These are important signals, as you know. At the last, we are starting to become aware and to act concretely, starting from the assumption that education, aware of the thin line between education and indoctrination, is not a simple tool able to accompany change and social transformation. Education, the quality, as you know, a complex uh, concept, uh, of the education and training process is the fundamental infrastructure of any process of innovation and change. Social and cultural factors are as important as economic factors, if not more so. So education is citizenship, education is democracy, and uh, democracy is complexity. Uh, the objective of this panel is to highlight the strategic relevance of uh, educational process in rethinking and rebuilding a new global citizenship without a, within sorry, a culture of responsibility, indispensable instrument for creating a truly democratic system. These complex instruments require long-term action necessary for uh, constructing cultural change and a culture of prevention. Currently, the politics fall and the policies of the nation states, which have been thrown into a profound crisis by globalization, continue to fall back uh, on short-term rationales and instruments. Social transformation, which will never be fully realized without centering it around the people, require systemic change, uh, which must be a bottom-up, a grassroots process directly involving the quality of education and training. The time has come to begin questioning to per the persistent economistic paradigm, which continues to reinforce the hegemonic opinion, which I consider nearsighted and deceptive, sorry, that processes of change and transformation can be determined solely and exclusively by legal, technological, and economical factors perpetrating a vision of society as a gigantic mechanism. It would be interesting to hear what suggestion our speakers today will make about education toward societal transformation. So I'm very happy to have with us today, Frank Dixon from Global System Change and WAAS, Petra Quenke, from the Collective Leadership Institute and the Club of Rome, Peter Schlösser from Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation and from Arizona State University, and Zibnie Bogniars from Kosminski University in Warsaw and the Evans Institute of Seattle. I'm going to ask you to answer, um, uh, to answer five, three, five questions. You can answer them in any order. And of course, at any point you may feel are relevant. I'd like to begin with Frank Dixon, but I first of all, I'd like to start with the, with the questions that we, we share and uh, studied with my friends Gary, Gary Jagovs. Uh, question number one, how far is current social science able to describe and explain the process of societal transformation and provide to different disciplines and understanding of the complex multidimensional social processes radically reshaping global society today. Question two, 
uh, what uh, change may be needed in the prevailing disciplinary silo-based structure of knowledge, a strategic uh, problem, in order to enhance both our understanding of the process and our capacity to widely disseminate that knowledge to today's yards. Uh, question three, what change may be needed in the prevailing modes of thinking emphasized by the current system to enhance our capacity to comprehend what is uh, happening and how we can effectively influence the direction uh, and speed of adaptation needed to address current challenge. Question four, what fundamental change would be needed to impart a workable understanding and uh, practically applicable knowledge of social change processes to those working in different fields? And the last, question five, what example can be said to illustrate the power of uh, such uh, knowledge for rapidly altering social outcomes? Frank, please, you are the first in uh, our order disorder. Please. Thank you very much, Piero. It's an honor to be part of this esteemed panel. Uh, okay, so in terms of the, the questions, um, how do we, you know, for example, how do we overcome siloing in higher education and disseminate effective inter integrated processes for societal transformation? I'll split my comments into two sections. One talking about an objective reality uh, framework for, that can be used to guide the development of societal transformation processes. And another one about changes needed in education to facilitate societal transformation. So we've discussed this, these subjects extensively in our societal transformation group at the World Academy of Arts and Science, something that was started right after WASA's 60th anniversary celebration in February. And many people say that we know what we want, but we don't know how to get it. So that leads to a focus on societal transformation processes. And that's true, we know at a high level what we want. Most people would say we want humanity to survive and prosper over the long term. But when you think of all the challenges we face and the many actions needed, their complexity can become overwhelming, which can kind of sap the enthusiasm needed for transformation. For example, in Petra's excellent recent paper about repurposing capitalism, she identified many different actions needed for societal transformation, a key question is how do we coordinate those uh, coordinate those actions? So address that to address that, I'd like to emphasize a key point, which is the distinction between uh, system change content or process. And content should take priority. Content uh, effectively is the change that you want. The process is the way to achieve it. So for societal transformation. The content would be the qualities of sustainable society, the endpoint, what we're trying to achieve, and the major changes and actions needed to get there. Once that's clear, then you can develop effective processes for achieving it and use that as a structure to integrate all the thousands, if not millions of different actions needed to achieve societal transformation. So um, having this kind of clarity a vision and the way to get there builds enthusiasm for uh, societal transformation because people can cut through the complexity and have a clear understanding of how to get to the destination. It facilitates the development of effective processes and, and, and gives us a framework for coordinating the many different actions. So, uh, and my suggestion for education would be that this content be clarified uh, throughout all levels of education, not just higher education that we teach from a young age about the integrated whole system of humanity, what it looks like in sustainable form and the major actions needed to get there. And I think a key issue would be to help young people understand three questions. What's happening in society? Why is it happening? And how do we solve the problems? So at a summary level, what's happening is that we're violating the laws of nature. So our systems are collapsing. The reason it's happening is that our reductionistic thinking has developed flawed systems uh, that force, force us to degrade the environment and society. And the solution is to adopt higher level whole system thinking, use that to produce sustainable systems that compel us to abide by the laws of nature. So um, to do that, we need an objective reality framework uh, for societal transformation. 
The SDGs provide one definition of sustainability, but it's an incomplete vision. Uh, it doesn't address everything. Uh, they're human-centric instead of nature-centric, which in, a, in that sense means they're not based on reality, and they don't uh, discuss how to achieve the goals. Um, one, uh, in my Global System Change books, I laid out a three-part simple uh, framework for societal transformation. The first part is using the laws of nature to define sustainable society. These include qualities that are always present in living systems. When they're not present, the system dies or changes. These go beyond human philosophies. They're matters of objective reality. They will completely determine the extent to which humanity survives on this planet, not the SDGs, the laws of nature. These include things like equitable resource distribution, widespread cooperation, decentralizing uh, production governance, equally valuing generations and species, producing no waste, living off of renewable resources, and enabling individuals to reach their fullest potential. Also implied operating principles of sustainable systems are equality, full cost accounting, and uh, full employment. So with the end state clear at a high level, the next step would be to define the systemic changes needed to get there. Three principles to do that would be emulate nature, democracy, and the rule of law. The answers to how to evolve human systems are implied or shown in, in natural systems in almost every case. Democracy is the only sustainable form of government because it's based on people's innate rights to equality and self-government. And uh, the rule of law is a perfect example of, of a simple framing mechanism to make a complex system change understandable. There are many different economic and political systems laws that force companies to degrade the environment and society. These are the root causes of climate change and other problems. If, if you rolled them all up into one overarching system flaw, it would be the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impact. In competitive markets, this makes it impossible for companies to stop harming the environment and society and remain in business. If they do, their costs go up and they go out of business. So the rule of law says, do what you want, but don't hurt anyone. Our systems massively violate that by allowing companies to cause harm. So, if, and it does this in many ways, externalities, time value of money, limited liability, they all roll up to not, to not holding companies responsible. So if the meta flaw is not held responsible, the meta solution is hold companies responsible. That's a simple, even not debatable concept that everyone can understand. It's a good way to frame up a simple uh, solution. Okay, now in terms of um, the, the third part is once you identify the end state, the systemic changes needed to get there, like holding companies responsible, then the third part is what are the actions needed to bring about these changes? They're needed in all areas, the general public, government, and corporate financial. This framework leads to the development of effective processes. One quick example of, of a process that results from clear content is system change investing. Companies have great power to drive system change. They're largely controlled by investing. We've been using investing successfully for 20 years to engage companies in sustainability. We can use the same approach to engage them in system change by rating them on system change performance, shifting investments based on that. This is going to um, incentivize companies to do a lot of things that they're not incentivized to do now, like go to government and ask to be held more responsible instead of less to work with media to end the civil war between conservatives and liberals in the US. That's probably the largest problem in our country. It makes people unable to work together on their many common interests. So we can begin to rate companies on, are they supporting media that divides citizens or unites them? So with that kind of, um, that kind of framework, I think is essential for coordinating uh, and developing effective societal transformation processes. In the few minutes I have left, let me just touch on education um, for societal transformation. A major principle is that education follows society. In other words, education does what society is focused on. So our systems um, are focused on maximizing economic growth and shareholder returns that concentrates wealth and powers. So our educational system needs to be able to compel the many to work for the benefit of the few. Um, our system is a legacy of the Protestant Reformation and the Industrial Revolution. The goals were, and largely still are, 
uh, indoctrination and obedience training. So our educational systems uh, teach young people to obey authorities, not question prevailing ideas, and uh, tolerate boring jobs for the rest of their lives. It's, you know, it would be a good structure for a totalitarian society. It does this in many ways. Uh, competitive grading, for example, weakens young people's self-esteem and social and emotional skills. It teaches them competition instead of the overwhelming cooperation of sustainable systems. It teaches them to see peers as obstacles to their success. And it makes children with average and below average grades feel inadequate. Um, standardized curriculums teach them that their own interests are not important. They should focus on what authorities say is important. They're um, constantly monitored, monitored, strictly disciplined. Uh, they are, you know, some schools, their privacy is violated with online uh, things that collect their personal and, and performance information and then share it with others. Uh, some schools mandate psychiatric drug use for disruptive children. With high student debt, we take away the ability of young people's freedom to follow their lives and often have to take jobs they don't like. This is the result of a system that's focused on maximizing economic growth. If we switch our system to maximizing individual and collective well-being, it'll lead to massive changes in, in all, le all levels of education. Uh, we'll focus on the most important things needed for life success, like building high self-esteem, strong social and emotional skills, critical thinking skills, and empowerment to follow one's life or follow one's bliss. Um, a key way to do this is freedom-based education. It's a well-established successful procedure that eliminates competitive grading, standardized curriculums, strict discipline, mandatory drug use, will fully fund higher education and make tuition free or low cost for public uh, schools. We in the US, we should equally fund K through 12 education. Now we provide two to three times more funding for children in wealthy communities um, and will empower teachers and professors uh, one with, with adequate pay. A generation ago, most professors were tenured or on a tenure track. Now many of them are adjunct professors on po earning poverty level wages. This limits their freedom to uh, think independently and teach young people to do the same. We'll emulate leaders like Finland and we'll teach higher level reality-based whole system thinking. Teach young people to the interconnectedness of society, cooperation, empathy, wisdom, the qualities that are more associated with feminine. And by doing that, we'll elevate the, the status of women in society. So the bottom line is that um, providing clear system change content will e lead to effective processes. Now we can uh, proceed with, uh, with Petra, Petra Klinken. Yeah, we are welcome and, and we are hearing you. Please, Petra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the questions. I think these are really five good questions. Let me let me just start with with number one. Uh, you know, how far is current social science able to describe and explain process of processes of social societal transformations? And I would say it is not at the moment. Uh, at least, at least not sufficiently. And the, the big question is how do we how do we get there? You know, what actually needs to be happening in in educational uh, systems? to, uh, I would say, to perceive the need to have better science on transformations, because I think we are at the beginning. It's not that we don't have history, it's not that we don't have biology, it's not that we don't have social science and sociology and uh, psychology, apart from the fact that this is all like, of course, too silo, silo based. Uh, but there is quite a lot of um, ongoing uh, on multidisciplinary approaches. And if you particularly live in the EU, like I do, uh, then, then kind of there's almost no project that is not a multi-transdisciplinary project. But, but it, it, the question is, does it hit the point? You know, does it really hit the point? And I do think it doesn't hit the point as long as, as the science stays in the, in, the, in the historic realm of a certain definition of reality and a certain definition of uh, society. And so what actually needs to happen is to rewind or to let's say uh, transform or to to move towards a new fundamental question and that question is so prevalent at the moment uh, where we're still in the middle of the pandemic you know where we have uh, a kind of biodiversity loss where we are in the middle of a climate crisis the 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 new really north star 
uh, that that not only is relevant for repurposing economies, as I wrote in the in the Cadmus article, but also repurposing education is the is the deeper question of how do we serve life. And now you can say, oh, well, wait a minute, this is too big a question. <laughs> there are too many answers and there might be political answers that we don't want. And, you know, like, so, so you, you may, in a way, you may say, no, that question is too simple. I would say, no, that question is not too simple if we add a few other questions. And one of the, one of the issues that, that is really like, like my, my passion is the question, what give li gives life to systems? That is a very fundamental question. And that leads us to understanding that we do not understand enough. And just to give you an illustration of that, uh, there is, um, you probably, uh, what's her name, Suzanne Simat? Uh, the biologist and the, the forester who has uh, written the book about uh, finding the mother tree, you know, kind of, uh, she's done lots and lots of research about the communication and, and the possibility of, of interacting with each other in forests. And you would say, ah, oh, you know, this is just a side issue of biology. And I said, no, no, wait a minute. This is not a side issue. This is about understanding what gives life to systems. And uh, what is so fascinating about her work is that she tells us what we don't know yet because we don't even start looking at these things. So what actually needs to be happening in education is to move what at the moment is at the fringes of the system, you know, kind of all these crazy people who do some funny stuff. Yeah, so that, that actually needs to move into the center. And I'm not saying that these people at the fringes of the system need to take over the entire system. I, I'm not saying this, but, but there needs to be a new kind of openness to say, wait a minute, do we ask the right questions? You know, and are our research questions so dominated by not only the last kind of 40, 50, 60 years of, of neoliberal capitalism, are our research questions determined by centuries, if not a couple of thousand years, of, of thinking processes that, that enhance the human brain and thinking in binary options. And interesting enough, the internet is the most, <laughs> most highly developed binary options, and there are people who develop a different internet. So, okay, I don't want to go there. But what is so interesting is to, to say um, in education, we need to I'm not, I'm not saying completely overcome the binary thinking because it might be useful to a certain extent and it has been useful a lot in science. We don't want the, to, to, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, bath uh, but we need to be able to integrate a completely different thinking. And that is a thinking that at the moment is not judged as, let's say, credible enough. I mean, like, of course, there, there are many people within the, 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 the science system, within the tertiary education system that are already walk in this direction. But if you look closely, and that is quite interesting also to see in feminist research, because feminist research was only introduced like in the 70s, 80s into universities. And uh, there is brilliant work that has been, has been done in, in feminist research. However, uh, number two, it didn't become mainstream, although the questions that were asked of feminist research should by now be mainstream. And this is not just about gender equality, equality. this is about a different view of life processes. Uh, and, and secondly, if you look closely, the style of feminist research became more and more like traditional science. So, you know, so it means that if we talk about transformations, we need to be aware that uh, a certain structural setting of our organizations in the, in the education system uh, encourage us to, to think in the old way. So, so the big challenge is now how to move a question like what gives life to system at the center of education, at the, you know, how to make such a question a new North Star 
of of what we are doing because if i ask the question what gives life to system wow suddenly there's a lot to discover that we don't know and suddenly what we already know we might start to rearrange and understand in a different way so it's terribly useful and um kind of the pandemic has shown that one can one can have different opinion opinions about about vaccination or not vaccination and one can have different opinions about the money that's being earned with vaccination but what is so interesting is that i would say for the first time in history scientists work together to understand the whole system in a completely different way and without that and, and this is normal science. This is not the new life science, you know, that we are talking about. But, but it, it, something is already starting that is transdisciplinary, that goes beyond the traditional ways of doing things, that um, it creates uh, a, a, an element that needs to be coming into education much, much more. And that is an element of responsibility for the future. And uh, so, I believe that that if if we enter the question what gives life to systems into education, it makes a huge difference and people are going to become creative about answering these questions in their particular field. It could be agriculture, it could be biology, it could be psychology, it could be sociology, it could be math, it could be, you know, like, uh, but, but, the, but the question uh, would engender a lot of further questions around particular subjects and immediately if you ask such a question you have to take a holistic approach uh, you have to take a, 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 a human approach i would say you have to take a humane approach because the humane approach actually includes your relationship with nature and you have to take an approach that is a more societal approach towards an egalitarian society because you, you will notice pretty soon that anything that is about uh, um, abuse of power, you know, kind of, or, or domination of others is certainly not life enhancing, even if it claims to be, you know, like dictatorship sometimes. So, but, but in the medium to long run, never in history was any domination or any any abuse of power, life enhancing. So it is actually necrophil, it's life deadening and not uh, deadening, it's not biophil. And so the, the issue is that it, it is so important to, to find that central way of looking at, at what our responsibility on this planet in a different way. And honestly, I think this is starting the the gender equality is an important step towards it simply because domination and let's say abuse of hierarchy and abuse of power and uh, people not kind of certain parts of the population not being able to live their full potential is not life enhancing it doesn't serve life and so the the issue that i would like to get across is yes if we bring a new north star into thinking why and how we educate and what for and and not only look at the topic of life enhancement but also in enhance the spirit of students in terms of excitement about what they do and why they do that and what the contribution is for the future then that would make a huge difference and i believe that it's possible to bring this in in the current educational system Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. Very interesting, both the, the, the speech. Uh, now it's uh, Peter's turn, uh, who I listened to with great inter interest uh, yesterday. I think that the, the, the challenge is, uh, is to rethink and uh, act uh, society and democracy as complex systems and, non and not complicated system. And we have to rethink the architecture or our uh, skills and knowledge. Uh, so, please, Peter. Thank you, Piero, and, and thanks for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, of this panel. Uh, as we all have actually strayed a little bit from the questions, um, let let me try to uh, take a bit a different um, 
approach to to the combined set of questions and so the topic is education for societal transformation let's start by asking why do we need societal transformation and what does it mean to have societal transformation at this time in the evolution of our planet because we always had societal transformation we always have evolution that brings transformation with it but we are living at a time where we see what is what is often called the, the great acceleration in the evolution and the change that comes with it of our planet and there the question then is why do we actually see that and why do we see the pressures that push us into the space of need for accelerated transformation because i think that that is an important distinction that we have to make and in my view it clearly is the belief that humankind had for a long time that our planet is limitless limitless in space limitless in resources limitless in giving us what we ask it to give us now we learn increasingly on many fronts that this of course is not the case the the planet does have limits and we are pushing them and in some cases you could uh, you could say we actually have transgressed them and that actually is felt more and more now we have responded by saying well we have to transform virtually all the systems on the planet and we typically justify that by saying we have reached planetary boundaries if you look at the planetary boundary hypothesis which often is used and i think there is some some good reason for it they are all environmental boundaries then you have to ask why are we actually reaching environmental boundaries well it is the decisions that we as humans individuals groups nations global society have made in the way we live on that planet and so in that sense we we actually have forced the need to respond to these pressures and to transform at a, a very rapid rate that that then asks uh, the question of what what does that mean what what option space do we have and typically we are starting to look at transformation of systems that are actually easier to capture like technological systems like the energy system new energy grids um power systems um the we, we are looking for technical solutions to the climate problem to the water problem to the food problem that all is important we have to understand that but we will not succeed if we don't understand what i would shorthand what is the societal will understand how do people make decisions that would get us out of that pressure situation into a situation where we have more options in a way we have to stop narrowing the option space for future generations coming to education and coming to youth we have to shape our future in a way that allows life to thrive on a healthy planet now that that sounds simple but it's not that simple because there are a lot of complexity in, in complexities in that in order to get to the understanding of what is the quote unquote societal will we have to recognize that we are driven not by insight but most of what drives us are value systems these value systems are typically long lasting and long living and to address them means to first of all recognize them and and confront them what that then means in terms of moving closer to the part of the education we have to approach that more from a full system understanding and if i look at full system studies and that was already addressed a bit uh, by by petra who said you know social science is not yet where it should be we often when we have projects that need a good balance between all the sciences including social sciences humanities natural sciences engineering sciences medical sciences social sciences are often attached at the last moment as something that we say oh and we by the way we need social sciences to understand you know aspect abc typically as an afterthought 
not fully integrated. So I would say social sciences have to be moved to a level where they are recognized equally with all the other sciences. Uh, having grown up in the German system, moving to the US system where I spent the last 30 plus years, in the US, social sciences and humanities are not even called science. Science are the quote unquote hard sciences. And then there is all that other stuff, the fluffy stuff, right? That, that we, we sometimes tolerate, sometimes we don't even tolerate. We, I think a fundamental precondition of getting to transformation, social transformation is to change our perception of who in academia has to contribute what. And in the Global Futures Laboratory, for example, being trained as a physicist, I actually moved the understanding of societal will, which means putting social sciences, humanities into the center of what we are doing, not minimizing what we have to do to understand the environmental systems, but recognizing that all our understanding of the environmental systems will not need to transforming to a better future if we are not understanding the societal will, which means understanding uh, how uh, society can be transformed. And that means bringing social sciences, psychology, um, even humanities into the center. And that is a process that is not yet as developed, not as fast as it should be. Now, how can we help students to get in onto a different track? It, it really has to radically change the way we train. We cannot continue to train our students along disciplinary lines. We have to really get them more into a domain where they learn system thinking, where they learn to understand complex systems. That can be from intuitive understanding to fully quantitative understanding, but without having a feeling what complexity is, we cannot find our way in our world because our world is the ultimate complex system. And we are living in it, we are shaping it, the question is, are we shaping it purposefully or are we shaping it stochastically? So, so there are some, some real fundamental questions that we not just have to contemplate, but that we have to start to implement measures to overcome some of the impedances that get us to that. And I think it's, it's up to all of us who have some influence over where our academic institutions are going, because this is looking at where academia sits in all of that and be brave sometimes and somewhat disruptive and quote unquote radical in our thinking and try it. I can assure you, if you are working with the young people, they are often ahead of us. They are receptive to that. They have the mindset that you, we often hear, you cannot expose students to such a broad agenda. You, you have to let them learn something that they know well, and after that, let them dabble into other things. That's absolutely the wrong way to do it. We have to expose them early on to the broad set of issues, to the complexity of them. And with the digital world that we are in, the fact knowledge almost can be pulled in to a certain extent, real time, if you understand the underlying dynamics of complex systems. They are, they are with it. They can do it better than we are. We have to let go of trying to control everything and create space where the young people actually have a voice in what education should look like, a voice in what the purpose is, and a voice in how they see the future of the planet. I will conclude my, my remarks on that. Um, I, I know I did not go into the details of your questions, but I thought there are so many experts who will do that, that I wanted to highlight a few of what I think are the overarching context setting issues that we have to recognize as we are going deeper into, into the details of the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we have a, a very little, little time. So now it's turn for uh, Zibriak Borniak. Zibriak, please. Thank you, Piero. Uh, well, it's easy for me because you already uh, raised the issue and uh, indicated conclusions. 
which uh, I was going to, to talk about. So anyway, I'm 53 years in academia and then we, we have here a common understanding uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to raise the issue for all of us uh, and a question, and I try to answer this. Do we have a common language uh, among us to resolve, uh, uh, to move forward, to resolve our planet uh, problems, uh, to resolve current and emerging crises? Uh, I think that this is something what we have to work and. From my point of view, I am very much uh, committed to system analysis, and I was it was really a type of bread and uh, honey for me reading uh, Frank's uh, paper uh, since uh, the, the first uh, Jay Forrester model. I'm really committed to this way of thinking, and I, I, I think that this is something if we will try to use this. Uh, 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 as a meta language, you know, uh, system analysis, maybe we could find the contribution and somehow find understanding from other disciplines what we are going to, to talk. And I, it was very clear, you know, I mean, Petra uh, used the life as a system. I mean, this is that type of approach. And uh, I mean, from that point of view, we don't have uh, I believe uh, among our uh, self uh, differences, but this is still a, a problem to communicate. The second issue, what uh, we did not uh, uh, touched so far, uh, this is the role of institutions. How institutions influence results of our educational work, uh, are they encouraging to, uh, uh, implement or just uh, make barriers. I, I think about institutions, first of all, of the, what the sense, formal and informal, about new uh, rules, norms, standards. These are the basic institutions, organizations. I, some of them might be the, uh, the have organizational form, but such basic institution, what I am talking is the language. This is the ins basic institutions which help us to communicate with rules, norms, standards, and so on. This is something what uh, I think that we should uh, work uh, on. So anyway, I went through these questions and I have very fast uh, answers. First question, I guess we have some seeds uh, uh, and elements uh, in institutional economics, behavioral economics, you know, to put, you know, particularly the, the work of uh, Eleanor and uh, uh, Vincent Ostrom from Indiana University. I, by the way, this is the first Nobel Prize winner, and a, a woman, you know, and I was very, uh, very lucky to, to, to work with them. And the other um, um, people uh, connected with the University of Minnesota, I spent 20 years, Professor Kurvich and uh, Vern Rutan and his Japanese uh, 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 collaborator, Hayami. I mean, they, all well that talking, you know, to find global solution, we need to start up from the bottom, bottom up uh, approach, build the consensus and go step by step uh, forward. So um, the second question, we need to train differently uh, uh, teachers, period. And this is something what we are, dominated, particularly in Europe, you know, this is a basic difference between the American uh, system and, uh, I mean, it's changing in Europe, uh, but still in Europe is too much on knowledge transfer, uh, not enough on building skills and attitudes, you know, the building that type of uh, competency with communication up front. And then the third one, uh, this is something what, how to, uh, introduce that type of system thinking, what you were talking already, and this is particularly Petra emphasized. Start classes from kindergarten to university, bringing them to the forest, to the park, to show, uh, okay, this is the, the system we live, and how we are interconnected. This is something what we need to 
emphasize from the very beginning that we are responsive and building not on the knowledge, but also the attitude of responsibilities. We are part of this. This is something uh, what, what is missing, uh, and, but there are some good examples. I am impressed with the Scottish uh, uh, experience and curricula, which now are trying to spread out uh, over Europe. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we need to uh, focus more on institutions, and I will come back to that issue, uh, talking about examples. Very simple example, I mean, I, how the holistic thinking uh, changed the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the way of acting, because this is something what uh, we want to say. After, after uh, transformation, beginning of transformation in Poland, we gave uh, a new institution, big independence of uh, local government. And so we prepared uh, also the, the type of uh, blueprint for uh, with Polish scholars and international uh, for collaboration 91 and then 1990 and then distributed to all uh, local governments, uh, regional governments. And then a year later, we visited them. We were surprised in small village at the uh, uh, ancient forest to Hola, how they resolve difficult problem uh, uh, of collecting garbage, which uh, somehow destroyed the, the environment, you know, the, the natural capital they live on because agro-tourism was the second. They just selected, this was their initiative, you know, selected for a year for free or garbage because everybody wanted to, to have clean environment around to bring tourists, to be attractive. And after the one year, they had the town meeting and say, well, do you like how our village, our community looks like? Yes, sure. Okay, now we know how much you uh, make garbage from next year, we will charge you at the cost. So anyway, system thinking also. And then another example, which I was impressed with uh, my colleagues and later friends uh, from Japan, Professor Jun uh, Wee and uh, Tsuneo Tsukatani, they came to Poland in the late 70s because they discovered that many uh, Polish uh, chemical companies are using uh, highly uh, polluted uh, uh, with uh, mercurium, uh, coal, uh, and also in some uh, electric power station, and to warn them because they made research already in Minamata, and they found out how uh, dangerous it is. They were thinking globally. We say, uh, say, well, it's not enough if we will resolve problem in Minamata. In fact, you know, that time was in the 70s was not resolved. But they shared the knowledge. They were thinking globally, you know, we, need, we have knowledge, we need to share, not keeping for ourselves. And later on, I came to, uh, to Japan and then uh, I went to Minamata based on their recommendation. I spent one uh, week there. It was the, the best, the toughest uh, um, lesson of ecology and social sciences, natural sciences, from the people, 10,000 victims uh, of uh, Minamata disease, mercurium poisoning was fighting 20 years with the government to be recognized as victims. Finally, they won, but uh, uh, the polluted bay, the base for their uh, uh, existence uh, just disappeared. Thanks God, they convinced the uh, government and this is something what I would like to say at the end, you know, because we are talking about academia and uh, education, and we need to partner it with the government. Finally, after a uh, tough uh, fight, government gave them the land around and they moved to organic agriculture. Do you know what's going on now? Now Minamata is the most sustainable city in Japan and probably worldwide. This is how they learned tough 
thinking systematically uh, about uh, the environment. And finally, as I mentioned, I had a project in Poland, you know, we, uh, and then in other countries too, I am finishing. Okay. And then uh, we prepared uh, these uh, blueprints for sustainable development, that type of holistic thinking. And during the first uh, 20 years, we were able to introduce many elements of, of this, include, and with positive effects like 70, 80% uh, reduction of industrial uh, NOx uh, and uh, SO2 pollution, the, the components of uh, acid rains. But uh, that uh, type of institutions we proposed and policies were not reformed. And by year uh, 2015, we came uh, with, uh, I mean, the, the, the conservative government uh, arrived and started destroying yeah. these institutions. So anyway, and now they influence also education. So even if uh, academia will find the way of the solution, we need to collaborate with uh, government and, uh, 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 and uh, non-governmental organization to introduce these changes. Either otherwise, we, we will have that type of disastrous effect because there are more and more history and you know type of uh, um, conservative agenda which uh, builds nationalism, xenophobia, and so we are really moving back from the progress achieved uh, during the first okay. years. Okay. So anyway, uh, education is very important, but we need, and then we need to find consensus among ourselves. But we need to find the political support from government and from the public, and this is something what because of the, uh, the the situation in Poland, you know, and that some other countries like Hungary and the other, we need to really educate not only about science, but social sciences and good citizenship. And this is something what we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Sorry. Very interesting speech. And now time for conclusion for uh, uh, our, our president, Frank Gary Jacobs. Uh, and then we can try if uh, the few seconds to to uh, have some comments. But uh, I think that this this conclusion uh, uh, will be starting points, not only for us. Please, Gary. Thank you, Piero, and thanks to the panelists for what I consider an outstanding discussion of topics that we have been exploring from many different perspectives over a number of years. But I think the coherence of the, the multiple perspectives that have come together by the different uh, contributors is really marvelous uh, to me to listen to. Uh, I'd like to try to uh, just no way to summarize all and no purpose in it when we have this record, living record to be dis distributed. But I'd like to just point out a few very important issues that have been raised that are essential for our future work, I think not only in the academy, but in collaboration with partners all over the world. Uh, Peter made a very important observation that the evolution of society is nothing new. Uh, uh, and that's true. It has been uh, evolving over millennia. Uh, but then what is new today, I think, is important for us to understand. One of the things that's new is never before has the evolutionary, the evolution of society stood to determine the whole future of humanity. Where we're no, whatever we do individually for our own benefit or uh, pain or suffering, uh, never before have, have the 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 risks and the potential rewards been of this magnitude. Secondly, never has the, the pressure and necessity of speed of response been anything like this. In, in, I mean, the industrial revolution spread over two centuries. We, th we see changes uh, like COVID spreading over uh, around the world in, in a few months. Uh, so never before 
have we come to realize as a collective humanity the need that the only solutions lie if we do this together. And that is unprecedented. We recognized after World War II, at least the European, the warring nations recognized we can't afford another world war. But a lot of the world was left out of that process uh, anyway. But today we realize that unless everybody participates, unless everybody's engaged, unless we're all aligned, we'll be working at cross purposes and undermining our capacity, collective capacity uh, to achieve. So there is something unprecedented. And that comes, I think, to something very important. How do we make the process of social evolution, which has been long, slow, and independently operating, leading to catalysts and imitation and competition and so on. How do we make this a collective movement of humanity? And that raises the issues that Frank raised of what would be the values that, that run it, because he's absolutely right. It is the values that are going to determine the type of change. How do we build consensus for those values? And then one of our speakers, at least one mentioned the problem of power. <laughs> Those, we may have the values that we want, but do we have the power? Uh, because change is affected by power. And how do we instill those values into the centers of power or reframe the centers of power in such a way to really imbibe the values that we put on paper long time ago, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we now uh, push forward as the 17 sustainable development goals, but still without the organizational power to enforce them. So another uniqueness of this is, for the first time in humanity, we, we evolved nation states over centuries. Now we are compelled under pressure to evolve instruments for global governance uh, at a rate, pace, and to do something unprecedented in history, no longer in bits and pieces, it fits and starts. And we don't have the institutions to do that. And on top of all that, we have to have the humility to know we don't really fully have the knowledge of how to, how to consciously evolve ourselves. We may know what should be done. We may be very clear to us what everybody else should do, but how to get it done? And I think the humility to recognize this is to place us really at the forefront of where human evolution is today. We are trying to awaken and become conscious of the long process of our own evolution and how do we transform it into a conscious process with the aid of all the challenges and pressures, uh, whether it's COVID or climate change or nuclear proliferation or uh, whatever it is. And therefore, our, the, the pressure for our institutions to radically reframe themselves, it's not just education, of course, it's all the, the economy, it's a technology, it's governance, it's all the institutions. But I think we all agree that education plays a unique role in this. We can say it has a unique responsibility, but that sounds like passing the buck. Those who understand that without the knowledge, it's not going to happen in the way we need it. And that means we have a greater responsibility to look beyond our present knowledge, our present institutional survival. There's enormous pressure on institutions today in it, to survive in, in changing times and to adapt and to really align themselves to the, to the needs of the world. I think this is a message that's coming out from all that's being said at the conference, uh, that education is not a sector anymore. Education, we're, align, we're trying to align ourselves with the central aspirations and central needs of humanity. And there's nothing wrong with saying we don't have all the answers because our government, our democracy doesn't have all the answers. Uh, our civil society doesn't have all the answers. And there was one final point I think it has been mentioned perhaps by Frank or uh, by Zbig, uh, the, the necessity of bottom up. Whether we're talking bottom up or top down, 
I'm not convinced it's one or the other. I think we need it coming from all directions and, and all sectors uh, because, but there is a, there, but the point is the kind of dramatic revolutions that we've seen in the past have tended to be something in, implemented from above. But if you look at them, always because there was a sanction and preparation from below, where there was a readiness or an awakening or an aspiration from below, but never before have we been able to engage and mobilize global civil society or global humanity to come together, to mobilize our energy, to mobilize our aspirations, to mobilize the correct collective power of humanity, to work together. So this is, this is an evolutionary challenge worth working for.